Hello and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today we are talking about Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. Your hosts are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. Each week, our main event are the Book Insights episodes. Those will give you in-depth explorations of the best nonfiction books. But here in the Book Lounge, it's just an informal chat about the book of the week. Yeah, and uh, as curator, I'll give my take on each book and what my highlights are, why I think it's still relevant. And all our books, the, the idea is to expand your mind or help you advance in your work or your life. Yep, so let's do it. We'll weigh in on the books and give you latest news about the uh, author and, and the titles. Yes, yeah, so Hillbilly Elegy. It came out in June 2016 just months before the last election, and became a number one New York Times bestseller. And it sort of became famous, well, first of all, it's it's a great read, which we'll get onto it. But it also was seen as a kind of bellwether for the forgotten masses, if you like, the sort of flyover territory, people who elected Donald Trump to the presidency. So we thought it would be a very good time to look again at the book, given what we're just in the midst of the current election, and work out if there's you know anything that can still tell us about the about things today. That's right. Yes, as we're all uh, sitting on pins and needles, pulling our hair out over what has been such a dragged on and on election. Hopefully, this will be a nice little refreshing look at something political, but sort of election adjacent, if you will. Not quite <laughs> the madness we've all been living. Yeah, this is zoom out territory, long term yes. trends uh, kind of a look. So, right. hillbillies, not a term I was very familiar with having grown up in Australia and living in Britain. So for those who don't know, we're talking about working class white America. So it's sort of the whole book is the sort of two different worlds, J.D. Vance, the one he grows up into and the one he joins when he goes to university, etc. I guess his, his big points is about the disadvantage of the hillbilly society, things like thrift, hard work, ambition, pursuit of knowledge, all these things that parents, most parents, uh, most places try to inculcate into their kids. For him, this all these basic things were sort of absent when he was growing up. And another defining feature of hillbilly life, according to him, is this huge suspicion of elites from outside. The, this journalist, Colin Woodward, when he's writing about the residents uh, of the greater Appalachia, he said, they're intensely suspicious of lowland aristocrats and Yankee social engineers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, def- I definitely have been far removed from this whole culture as well. Having grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area, a quite metropolitan uh, place, you know, the Appalachian Mountains, I've never been. I don't exactly know where they are, somewhere in the middle of America. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I, I definitely can relate to sort of going, okay, wait, who exactly are hillbillies? I thought they were just cartoon characters. Are these real people? And people like being called this? Oh, okay. All right. I'm with exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> I, I didn't know it was a real thing. I thought it was like cartoon. So I yeah. looked it up and discovered that uh, the Hillbilly Territory is basically the Appalachian mountain range, which goes from Canada down to Alabama. So it's 1,500 miles, and it covers North Carolina, West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, or bits of those states. And the, the sort of ethnic background is Scots-Irish immigrants who went there originally. Um, so J.D. Vance, one of his key points is that this culture, Scots-Irish immigrant culture, has been incredibly persistent um, that you would think, it, you know, after 100 years it would disappear. But he thinks there's, there's something about this culture of these early immigrants that has stayed because it's a very closed-in society. Some of the people migrate to towns to like factories in Ohio like JD Vance's grandparents but many don't they just stay in the area and sort of not open to outside influences yeah we you know that was one of the interesting things that i found was as he talked about sort of that insular community and them being so sort of tight knit and closed to 
people who are outside of it. I've done a lot of like learning about different cultures because here in the Bay Area, it's incredibly diverse, lots of different countries represented. And so when I think about sort of intercultural, you know, uh, learning and, and those like culture shock of different, you know, people and places, not white people are not the ones I'm usually thinking about. So uh, exactly. this, was, this was really interesting. Like when he talked about, you know, his grandparents moving from Kentucky to Ohio and going into like just a little convenience store and their child playing with something that he wasn't supposed to. And, you know, the, the store owner telling the child to put the toy back or talking to the parents about it. And it just erupted into the parents breaking the toy and like, you know, cussing out the the employee and, you know, making a huge scene because of things like that. You know, I it was just so interesting that he relates this as like a culture thing of, you know, this is the way that this hillbilly culture is. You don't insult someone's child. You don't tell people what to do. There's this honor that must be um, sort of upheld at any cost. And anybody who steps on that is going to violently understand that they have done something wrong, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it was just interesting to, you know, in a in a sort of Scotch Irish, I guess that's just not what I think of when I think of like cross cultural experiences, but it definitely is. That's... Yeah, it's easy to lose sight of all this and all the usually, you know, we hear all the time about discrimination against non white people. So this book is a real eye opener. Some of the you have to read it because it's just full of these little vignette stories about JD Vance growing up. Uh, his big influence is his grandparents, his papa and mama. I don't think I've pronounced that wrongly. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Uh, um, so his grandpa, Jim, was 16, and then he knocked up 13-year-old Bonnie Blanton. And then so this, this couple knew they had to get out of town fast, otherwise the, the Blanton men, which is the town where they're living, thought you know that, that he would be murdered so they go they escape up route 23 to ohio and sit, settle in middletown there working in a steel company they're a sort of success story though right, <laughs> right. yeah D despite this background compared to a lot of the people there jd himself his, his mum bev you know has so many partners into drugs etc so jd moves between many different houses has many different father figures, there's, you know, alcoholism, drugs, violence, unemployment, abuse. But the weird thing is that in, in any culture, it'd be considered bad stuff. In the hillbilly one, there's sort of sources of entertainment and curiosity, mm. almost like there's this mad sort of sideshow going on. And so when JD later in life, he, he meets families like his, his future wife, Usher, who don't shout at each other and get into drugs and need payday loans. It's like, wow, this is normal. Right. Um, so, you know, it's uh, incredible. And the sort of, I guess, lack of any sort of sophistication. Like he, he grows up, the first time he goes to like a drinks party at college and he's offered wine and he didn't know there were like two types of wine. And Right. <laughs> Yeah. Or I've Go heard ahead. the uh, I've heard the little um, anecdote where he says even to this day now he's like making millions of dollars because, you know, as you fast forward through the story, you'll, you'll find he goes to Yale and becomes quite successful. But he says even to this day, one uh, seemingly indulgence that he just can't seem to get on board with is pajamas. <laughs> like he'll, <laughs> he'll spend money on other things, but he just cannot bring himself to buy pajamas because he's like the hillbilly culture you sleep in your underwear or your jeans whatever whatever like <laughs> yeah on the couch or just wherever you fall asleep it's right. like yeah anyway how does he get out of this of this world well his memoir sort of does encourage him to do his homework and you know sets aside a part of their house to do it and sort of encourages him to finish school and then he so he gets into Ohio State University, but not neither of them have any idea like how to fill in financial aid forms. So he balks at going to university and instead joins the Marines because he just thinks he doesn't know anything about how to live, anything about the world. So that'll be a good sort of learning place for him. And then he, he signs up just before the Iraq War 
And then later he does go on to university and then makes it to Yale. But he, he, he all the time he's saying there's nothing special about me. There was, I mean, obviously he's brighter than normal, but it was sort of through luck and circumstance that he manages to, to escape this world and sort of make something of himself. Yeah, it's really interesting how he attributes his sort of making it through all of these traumatic experiences of abuse and neglect and addiction that was all around him growing up. Um, and he sort of attributes it to sort of basic things like I had a quiet place to do homework. It's just like, mm. oh, and, then he's, and so many others didn't, you know, it's just like, yeah. Wow, I you know this book sort of reminds me of Educated by Tara Westover. Absolutely, yeah. You know that same like growing up very poor, but also being so isolated that you don't even know you're poor. You don't even know what you're missing because mm. your family has done such. They've gone to such lengths to ensure that you are isolated from everybody else. And you know this one, this family was not isolated from society as to the extent that Tara Westover was. But when your whole community all lives pretty much much like you do, then it's it's just a different form of isolation. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's it's not having any outside influences. I mean, it's. I should say that. I mean, in Britain, there's also this sort of, for want of a better word, white working class or underclass. Mm. So there's there's a lot of. Uh, it's been well studied, like the gap in performance between poor white boys and the average student in Britain has widened. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people get free school meals, which is sort of a sign of of deprivation. And then on the other hand, non-white kids in like British cities are doing much better. They're getting into universities at a record rate. So this idea, again, we can't circle back to this sort of forgotten masses, uh, I guess, white masses, the who plays very much into politics and, I guess, Brexit, things like that, Mm. that that politicians and metropolitan elites just sort of completely miss because they're not living in that world. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, just like our book last week, so this is our second memoir in a row now, just like We're Going to Need More Wine by Gabrielle Union, this book also... tells the story of J.D. Vance's upbringing and his life, but it's just as much a social commentary as it is anything else, um, Mm. because he's not just talking about his own personal experience. He's talking about his community. He's talking about a whole group of people that feel marginalized and have this culture of sort of being left out and never discussed. And then it even plays into sort of how that translates politically and what that turns into and um, and that's how he sort of got this moniker the Trump whisperer um, because <laughs> uh, it was sort of the people that felt like they are never the topic of conversation in the national sort of spotlight um, now they have a president talking directly to them and now they also have this book that was like a resounding cry of like this is our experience that nobody is talking about yeah, not that we're typecasting in any way. There's a lot of metropolitan, highly educated people who also vote for Trump, just sure. adding that in. <laughs> oh, yes, that's true, that's true. But um, what I find very interesting, what you're saying, is the way he, you would think that he would be totally defending his own sort of cultural background and people, and actually he doesn't. Mm. I mean, he... He goes into the obesity, obesity, the eating habits, mountain dew mouth is the phrase he uses yeah. for, for the bad dental uh, situation of uh, people where he grew up from because of their uh, drinking a lot of sugar, eating, etc. But the weird thing, like there's high unemployment, but at the same time, a lot of jobs go unfilled. And he's saying that the people either blame the government for everything or big companies who have like given all the jobs to China. And so it, it is at the same time that there's an honor culture, there's also a blame culture mm-hmm. and it creates this sort of hopelessness that, you know, there, there's no way out, that um, extreme pessimism, there's no sort of sense of social mobility. Mm-hmm. So 
he's, I guess, I don't know, where do you, uh, I guess the question is how, do you, how you get out of that sense of hopelessness. But he does actually lay the blame to some extent but at, with people themselves, like this sort of almost unwillingness to change. It's not just a sort of systemic or, or social thing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, you know, there's definitely mixed reviews on how people took that message. So some people see that in a very positive way of, you know, being able to see the things that must change. But others accused him of victim blaming, of Mm. sort of looking at poor people and saying, well, it's your own fault for being lazy kind of a thing. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's difficult because he grew up in that culture. So it feels like if there's anyone who's able to say something like that, it would be him because Mm. he that it's not like he's talking about some foreign groups. He's talking about his family, his friends, his community, his neighbors, and his own first person experience. And so he describes knowing people who would never want to show up to work on time, if at all, and then blame the government when they get fired, when it has Mm. nothing to do with, you know, that per se. Mm. And so those are like the sort of first person experiences that he's talking about. But there are criticisms of his book, and then now it's going to be turned into a movie, saying that it sort of blames poor people for being poor. So it's it, there's definitely some like some back and forth there, some nuance, and uh, it's a fine line. It's difficult to it's difficult to say really. Yeah. So what's J D Vance up to at the moment? I know he became he got into venture capital. Yeah. So what is he actually doing right now? Yeah. So um, through the book, you find out that he has gone to Yale and uh, sort of comes out of that and ends up becoming this like venture capitalist. And so now he's definitely far removed from his, you know, low income hillbilly life. He's definitely a millionaire. Now he's re- most recently partnered with Ron Howard to uh, – so Ron Howard will be directing Hillbilly Elegy, the movie. It will it's release – It's almost coming out, right? Yeah, yeah. It's coming out quite soon in three weeks. So uh, okay. Netflix will release it November 24th. Ah, it, uh, yeah. It's starring Amy Adams and Glenn Close. Mm-hmm. Um, check out our Twitter. I'll post the uh, trailer to the movie on the Book Insights Twitter. That's at – book insights pod so yeah you can check out the trailer and uh it, it looks pretty interesting you can definitely tell the whole story centers around because like we said the book is half social commentary half his life experience and the mm. movie definitely is hard on just his life experience like it's all about his yeah. mom bev his grandma um you know mama and so that those are amy adams plays the mother glenn close plays the grandmother. Oh, um, that's, yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, yeah, that's yeah. going to be scary. Right. You know, I didn't even recognize Amy Adams. She looks uh, completely different. Amazing. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see how that po- how that uh, comes out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so most recently, like three weeks ago, J.D. Vance was just talking with Tucker Carlson about um, sort of his fear of like an Orwellian erasure, or erasure of history. You know, with the election, everybody's talking about sort of what a post-Trump um, society is going to look like and what the government needs to do. And so some senator or a uh, labor secretary tweeted about a, needing a truth commission to kind of write some of the uh, misinformation that has come from the Trump administration recently. And J.D. Vance kind of came and said that this was very Orwellian to try and rewrite history and things. And um, mm. it's interesting because when the book came out, he was very clear about him not supporting Donald Trump because he yeah. felt like he was uh, making some of the problems that he describes in his book worse in terms of the violence and uh, just being very reactionary. And he sort of framed it as he he sees the appeal because, again, he talks about how Donald Trump talks to people in middle America that other politicians just seem to ignore. Mm-hmm. But he also s- points out sort of the problematic pieces of of his campaign in 2016 but it seems like for this 2020 election he's definitely coming to donald trump's like uh defense on on a lot of different things so he very well may have sort of switched camps in the past four years Um, got it yeah so yeah so that's kind of that yeah okay so politics aside i mean even if you're not into the, the sort of social commentary side the book is just a great read. That's why it's been picked up as a movie. It's, uh, yeah, very much a page turner like like Tara Westover's Educated. Mm. Sort of reads like a novel. Mm-hmm. So I do highly recommend 
uh, reading it, I'd, I'd, I'd give it a five stars as a sort of narrative non-fiction. How about you, Corinne? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I would give it five stars as well. I liked this book for all the same reasons that I liked, or many of the same reasons I liked, we're going to need more wine. It's adventurous. It feels like fiction because it's so far removed from the average experience. Um, it makes you think, it makes you laugh, it's shocking, it's it's uh, it's really entertaining and educational. It, it really gives you an insight into a people group that uh, at least I really didn't know much about and and the psych the psychology is in there too like uh, one of the quotes that i really liked was he says for kids like me the part of the brain that deals with stress and conflict is always activated we're constantly ready to fight or flee because there's a constant exposure to the bear whether that bear is an alcoholic dad or an unhinged mom mm. yeah so it's just this trauma lying yeah. there waiting to be triggered yeah, yeah. Yeah, seeing that, like those ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences and what those turn into and the cycle of violence, like there was just a lot of psychology that I, I really enjoyed uh, delving into and unpacking. That was just really fascinating. Yeah, none of which he knows at the time, of course, only sure. when he studies at college, etc. Right. Um, so it's just a great life trajectory as well. I mean, I inspiring in, in that respect, a sort of self-help way, I guess. Mm -hmm. But go listen to the book Insight because we there's a lot more detail on the sort of vignettes and scenes from the book that we cover. So yeah, if you want to want to get a bit more detail on what the what the book actually goes into, yeah, do listen to that as well as the book lounge. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the book lounge and uh, hope you tune in next week. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, as Corinne said, do look at our social media, Twitter, Instagram, and also have a look at the trailer for the movie. Yep. All right. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.